The only phrase I know how to describe our current situation right now is up shit creek without a paddle. Things have gone from bad to far, far worse since last night. And to tell the truth, everyone... Everyone is now scared out of their damn minds. Almost everyone. But I'll get to that in a minute. Before I say anything, let me again say thank you to those who commented on last night's post. Despite everything that's happened today, we managed to make some progress. I can't help but think that it was thanks to all of you giving us some direction. Let me quickly answer a few things that you've brought up. Okay, so first and foremost, as soon as I opened the laptop and saw the comment, I went and pulled one of the maps from the ship off the wall. Looking to see if there was indeed any sort of chapel or religious gathering area for us to hole up in, and unfortunately, Queen Elizabeth seems to never have built one on board. So, that idea's out. Secondly, the reason why we set up base camp in the lounge is because it was the first place we reached when we came aboard. And it's the place we know the best. After yesterday, though, and especially with our current predicament, I'm beginning to think... Moving to one or two adorning cabins might be a better idea. Not as much room for anyone or anything to creep up on us. That being said, let me tell you what happened today. We were roused by the captain just after the ten minutes of the morning. Come on, Nate, he said softly to me, shaking my shoulder. We've got work to do today. Then he moved away to wake the others. For another minute, I simply lay there, staring up at the ornate ceiling high above our heads. The horrible mental images of the shadowy figures had followed me into my nightmares, and I had dreamt of running down dark and seemingly endless hallways. The figures always just a step behind me. I shivered slightly as I remembered the voice welcoming me, welcoming all of us aboard. I attempted to force the image out of my head as I pulled myself from the sleeping bag into my feet. Once everyone was awake, we all quickly had breakfast before I broke out the computer to see what people had said. I quickly scrolled down to the comments I saw were there as the others came over. As much as I wanted to tell the others about what I had seen yesterday, a small part of me whispered that none of them would ever believe me. For another minute, I simply lay there, staring up at the ornate ceiling high above our heads. The horrible mental images of the shadowy figures had followed me into my nightmares. I dreamed of running down dark and seemingly endless hallways, the figures always just a step behind me. I shivered slightly as I remembered the voice welcoming me. Welcoming all of us aboard. I attempted to force the image out of my head as I pulled myself from my sleeping bag into my feet. Once everyone was awake, we all quickly had breakfast before I broke out the computer to see what people had said. I quickly scrolled down to the comments I saw were there as the others came over. As much as I wanted to tell the others about what I had seen yesterday, a small part of me whispered that none of them would believe me, especially after what Andrew, Spencer, and Will said they saw happen to me. If anything similar happens to me or anyone else, I'll tell them, but not until then. Everyone gathered around to read what you'd all suggested. I could tell to them it was like a lighthouse beacon, helping guide them to safety. I couldn't help but feel a small pang of disappointment flow through me as they again dismissed the ghost ship comments, even though I'd known it was coming. Apart from potentially the captain in me, nobody else had seen anything out of the ordinary. I shot a glance his way as he leaned in to read the screen, but any trace of fear I'd seen last night had been wiped away, replaced with his usual calm, calculating expression. Well, at least people seem to agree with my idea to find the keys, he said finally, standing back up and seeming somewhat pleased. Wyatt leaned in and pointed at another comment. Cap, what about this person's suggestion to move from the lounge to find some cabins to sleep in? I mean, that be a hell of a lot more comfortable than another night on the floor. The captain rubbed his beard, thinking. They may have a point. I wasn't able to get much sleep last night. We'll move our stuff into some of the first-class cabins. Just the same as yesterday, we were paired off into two teams, 
The captain, Andrew, and Spencer would head off to the cruise quarters to try to find the keys, while myself, Wyatt, Will, and Vinny would try and find any food that we could add to our slowly dwindling supplies. I very much didn't want us splitting up again, not after both what you all had said and what I'd experienced. But try as I might to say so to the captain, he remained steadfast. We need to cover as much ground as possible, Nate, he said, after we'd dumped our stuff into some adjoining cabins near the lounge. And with that, he turned and hustled the other two in his group away. I watched them go, saying a silent prayer for them to be safe before turning to the others. Well, which way do we go? Vinny asked, gesturing to the many hallways that branched away from us. I looked down and studied the map of the ship for a moment, my eyes drifting past the maze of rooms and lounging areas before settling on a large area near the stern of the ship. How about we start there? It looks like a restaurant called the Veranda Grill. The three men craned to look at the map. Sure, why not, Wyatt said, shrugging his shoulders. With our destination set, we turned and began heading aft. Passing through the lounge, we found ourselves in more hallways that seemed to stretch on forever. Man, they had a lot of cabins just in first class alone, Vinny said, as he passed a small sitting area looking out into the starboard side of the ship. Vinny lowered his voice slightly. Hey, did any of you guys have anything weird happen yesterday? The question caused me to stop dead in my tracks. What do you mean, weird? I asked. Everyone stopped now. Wyatt let out a soft groan. Oh, come on now, Vin. Nothing weird happened yesterday. The captain said so. But I could tell he wasn't being completely honest. Will's brow furrowed. What are you guys talking about? He took a step towards Vinny. Did something happen to you guys down in the engine room? Wyatt let out another protest, but Vinny seemed to ignore him. I don't, man. All I know is we were down there... Working like crazy to get the boilers up and running. When I look over, the captain stopped in the middle of giving us directions. I had no idea what to do next. I saw the big man shiver slightly before continuing. He had the creepiest expression on his face. It was like, like he'd been hypnotized or something. The lights were on when no one was home. Then he just snapped out of it. He looked absolutely terrified for like half a second and seemed to remember what was happening. He kept going. Wyatt cut in. That's because he didn't get much sleep last night. He literally told us that when you asked him what was up. Um, I swear to God, Vinny, you're making a mountain out of a molehill with this dude. Vinny shot a slightly irritated stare at him before turning back to Will and me. I just need to know. Any of you have anything weird or unusual happen to you guys yesterday? I exchanged a glance with Will. His expression was that of a perfect poker face, but... The look in his eyes betrayed what raced behind them. For a moment, neither of us said anything. I debated whether to come clean about my experience, but Will spoke before I did. No, nothing like that. Nothing besides accidentally tripping over an overturned chair. I felt a wave of surprise shooting through me. The entire time I'd known Will, I'd never known him to deliberately lie. He was someone who always told the truth, even if it ended up bad for him. The hell did this side of him come from? There, see? All is as well as it can be, Wyatt said triumphantly. Happy now, Vin? I saw him study our faces for a moment before shrugging. All right, guess it was nothing. And with that, he turned and began walking down the hall again. I spared another glance at Will, but he simply shrugged at me and turned to follow them. I stared after him for a minute, unable to move, until a familiar shiver shot up my spine, one that indicated I was being watched. I swung my head around, looking behind me, back down the hallway. Nobody was there. Nobody I could see, anyway. Feeling another shiver pass through me, I turned and jogged to catch up to the others, we found a set of stairs that, according to the sign next to them, led down to the restaurant deck from where we were on the main deck. Heading down a few flights, we found ourselves on yet another landing. Will suddenly let out a small laugh and pointed. Hey guys, check it out! Across the landing from us was what looked like a small booth. 
Glass and metal bars separated the person who sat inside from everyone outside. Looking up, I saw a sign hanging over the window. Pursuer's office. That must be where you drop off your paperwork you need to travel aboard, along with valuables you want locked up in the ship's safe, Wyatt said. He let out a laugh. You think there's anything valuable in there still? Jewelry, cash, shit like that? I turned to him, feeling a bit astonished. You're joking, right? He shrugged. Hey, we're alone on board here. If we took anything, I don't think anybody would know, he said, grinning slightly. Yeah, till a ship gets brought back to dock and the owner discovers shit missing from their dumbass. Vinny said in a displeased tone. After that, now it was Wyatt's turn to give him an irritated look. I was just kidding. Jeez. He looked down at the floor. Killjoy, he muttered. For my part, I gave him a long look and looked over at the pursuer's office again. I don't think it'd be anyone on land who'd be pissed if we stole anything, I thought. Before anyone else could say anything, the radio let out a squawk. My heart momentarily began to thud in my chest for a moment. I was terrified I'd heard the man's voice from it again. Instead, the elated voice of the captain came. Nate, we found the keys. You're hidden away in a desk in the captain's cabin. A feeling of relief washed over me, and I pulled the walkie-talkie from my belt and thumbed it as I saw relieved smiles across the other's faces. That's terrific, Cap. You want us to head straight up to the radio room? The man spoke again, a sharp burst of static masking his voice. Say again? Now the man's voice came in loud and clear. Negative, Nathan. We might still need some supplies. We don't know how long it'll take for anyone to reach us. And we're going to begin running low on food soon. Go check out the restaurants like you were planning and come meet us. Wyatt's face fell at his words, but I saw the other two nod at me. We'll try to be as quick as we can, over and out. And with that... I clicked off. Come on, guys. This way. I said, pointing to a sign at the start of the left hallway. Veranda Grill. This way. The four of us made our way down the hallway. A porthole stood open halfway down, and as we passed it, the smell of the ocean filtered in. I slowed to take a deep breath of it, letting it invigorate me a bit. And... froze. I, I did not just see that. But I knew I had. As we'd passed the porthole, I'd shot a glance out, hoping to catch a quick glimpse of the relatively calm waters. And I'd caught a split-second glimpse of... someone walking past it. It had been too quick to see anything besides a blur, but it had been enough. I felt the fear of yesterday return. <laughs> Shit. Not again, man. My heart raced in my chest, and I felt a lump form in my throat. Hey, you all right, Nate? The voice snapped me back. I looked up to see the others had turned to look back at me. All of them wore a confused expression on their faces. They fought to find my voice for a second, and then spoke, trying to sound calm. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that, guys, I said. Will cocked his head at me, giving me an odd look, but didn't say anything. Refusing the urge to look out the porthole again... I started walking, pushing past them to begin leading the way. Come on, let's uh, get this over with. For a moment I heard nothing behind me, and then I heard the others follow. Holy freaking shitballs, Wyatt breathed out. That's... wow. We stood at the entrance of the restaurant, next to a small sign that read, Please wait here to be served. For my part, I couldn't blame him for such a reaction. Even after what had just happened, I couldn't help but feel in awe of the expansive room in front of us. Like the rest of the ship, wooden paneling covered the walls. The only difference was that in here, squares and tiles of aquamarine had been indented into them. Some had ornate shapes, and across the room I saw a massive painting or stitching of what appeared to be a woman clad in ancient Greek or Roman clothing. Below her, four horses reared up as if to charge while several men seemed to hold everything up in midair. The tables with expensive-looking tablecloths littered the room, the sea-green upholstered chairs around them almost inviting people to come and sit in them. Shooting a glance to my right, I saw a huge grand piano set against the far wall. 
and a huge aquamarine curtain covering what must have been a window and stern deck. I don't even want to imagine what it must have cost to eat in here, Finney said, causing everyone to laugh softly. You're not joking, I replied, then pointed across the room at a metal swinging door. Look, that's the door to the kitchen. Winding our way through a sea of tables and chairs, we reached the door and stopped in front of it. I turned back to the others. All right, cross your fingers you find something, guys. Taking a deep breath, I put my hand to the metal door. We pushed. We found ourselves in a huge industrial kitchen. Pots and pans of all kinds hung from hooks on the ceiling, and multiple stoves stretched away on the far wall. Fanning out, we began to explore the room, opening cabinets and drawers. Got what looks like a flower here, then he called, holding out a large white bag. Uh, something, at least. Continuing on, we pulled out more than a few ingredients, but nothing we could immediately eat. It got worse when he opened a giant fridge and saw nothing but items like butter and milk inside. Damn it! Wyatt suddenly yelled, slamming the fridge closed. He leaned back against the door, leaning his head back. Then he spoke softly. Look, man, if they weren't at port when the storm ripped her away, it sounds to reason they might not have been much in the restaurants. We still have the holds and the meat locker to go through. At least we found some things. Wyatt's eyes snapped open. Then he glared at the man. Oh, yeah. That's always just like you, Vin. You always gotta try and cheer people up. I'm not talking shit about things that have no merit. I realized the situation must have been eating heavily at him, and it was finally bursting out. Finney narrowed his eyes and took a step towards him, clenching his fists. Hey, fuck you, man. At least I'm not the dumbass who thinks about robbing a ship when we should be searching for food. The two of them began to shout at each other, their voices filling up the room and bouncing off the metal walls. I shot a glance at Will, who wore a helpless expression on his face. Finally, I got to the point where I couldn't take it anymore. Shut up, both of you! I screamed out at the top of my lungs, feeling my own anger flare up at the petty squabbling. I stood there, breathing in deeply as the two went dead silent, turning to look at me with slightly astonished looks on their faces. I'm not someone who yells often. Usually I'm quiet and calm. When I yell, people take notice. For a few moments, there was nothing but silence in the kitchen, as we all stared at each other. Looks of shame and guilt fell over Wyatt and Vinny's faces, and I saw them open their mouths to speak, like likely to apologize. But whatever words they might have said died away as a sound suddenly sprang up behind us. Back through the metal door. The sound of a piano being played. It wasn't the sound that caused all of our faces to go pale, though, that, that made the blood in my veins turn to ice and a gasp to escape my lips. No, that, that was because along with the piano came the sounds of people talking and laughing softly. Occasionally, the sound of cutlery or glasses being picked up and put down, punctuated in between. My breaths began to come in short ragged gasps as I slowly turned to look at the swinging door. Vinny was the one who spoke first, his voice barely above a whisper. Fuck. I turned back to look at him. His mouth hung wide open, his lower lip trembling slightly. The sight frightened me more than the sounds emanating from back the way we'd come. Vinny isn't someone who spooks easily, after all. And again, this isn't exactly your normal level of creepy shit. The sounds continued. I heard what sounded like a woman letting out a particularly loud laugh. Wyatt spoke up. What do we do? He asked. The unspoken answer was one I had been trying to avoid in my head. Aside from the door, there was no other way out of the kitchen. I forced myself to take a step towards the door. Nate, what the hell are you doing? Vinny hissed at me, but I ignored him. Taking another step forward, with each step I took, the feeling of terror that I had had yesterday returned, rearing its ugly head to begin tearing apart my insides. I pictured dozens of shadowy figures, waiting just on the other side of the door for us, waiting for us to step out so they could rush me. But it was either sit in the kitchen until the sounds went away, if they go away, or open the door and peek out. And by the time I stood next to the door, my 
heart felt like it just finished running a furlong, and sweat rolled down my face. Oh, please, God, don't, don't let it happen again. Don't, don't let them be there. Slowly, I reached out with a trembling hand, watching as it made its way to rest on the metal, which felt shockingly cold to the touch. I turned and gave one last look at the others. They looked absolutely petrified. As I began to turn back, a new sound came, this one louder, almost ear-piercing. I ripped my hand away from the door, clapping both hands over my ears as they threatened to burst. What the shit? It continued for a few moments, and the realization slammed into my brain what the source was. It was the freaking ship's horn. Then it ceased, dying away, but leaving the sound echoing in my head. I slowly pulled my hands away, looking up to see everyone else doing the same. That's when I realized everything had gone dead silent. The sounds of the piano and people no longer came from the other side of the door. It was as if, it was as if they'd never even been there in the first place. Turning, I saw the others had realized it as well. Wyatt suddenly strode forward, pushing past me and slamming his shoulder into the door. It flew open, softly hitting the wall behind it with a thunk, revealing the empty restaurant, as empty as it had been when we'd entered. For a moment, he simply stood there as we gathered behind him and looked out. Then he took two steps into the room. No, there's no fucking way, he slowly muttered to himself. He swung away, an almost wild look in his eyes. I mean, you heard it too, right? Slowly, we nodded. His eyes darted around as he looked at the floor. That's freaking impossible! We're alone on this ship, but there... There were fucking people out here! People talking and shit! There was a, a fucking piano playing! He suddenly swung around, raising his arms and screaming into the empty room. What the fuck is going on?! The three of us slowly left the kitchen. Vinny went to stand beside Wyatt trying to calm him down, but I could see that the experience had, for lack of a better phrase, royally fucked up the man's brain. And that wasn't even half as terrifying as what I saw yesterday. The thought made me snap my head and look around the restaurant, half expecting to see shadowy figures emerging from the corners, but nothing stirred. The radio on my hip squawked, Nate, come in right now, over. I reached down, trying to steady myself. I took a deep breath and thumbed the walkie. I'm here. What's up, Cap? The man's voice came again, this time with a pang of surprise that there was a trace of anger in it. Whatever your team is, get the fuck up to the radio room now! I looked up from the radio, seeing that everyone had turned to look at me. I saw the same expression of confusion and worry as I must have had on my face. I hit the button again. We're on our way! Sparing a last look around the restaurant, I motioned for the others to follow as I hurried for the hallway. So you're telling me that none of you managed to get inside the radio room and rip out the microphone? The captain demanded, the veins in his neck bulging out from barely disguised rage. Everyone stood in front of the radio room, which now hung wide open, the metal door swinging slightly, letting out soft creaks. I looked inside, seeing the ancient setup sitting along the left wall of the room. My eyes ran over all the equipment stacked neatly on top of each other, finally coming to rest on the place where the microphone used for transmitting radio calls stood. They should say where it should have stood. Instead, the space lay bare, and I saw that it hadn't been gently pulled out of the system either. Frayed and snapped wires hung from the jack still hooked into the radio showing someone had ripped it out with great force. I finally found my voice. No. No! I mean, none of us would ever do that. Not not where we want to get off this ship. He shot a glare at all of us, then shook the keys in his hand for emphasis. So you're expecting me to believe that while we went to hunt for these, that the room just happened to unlock itself, and the microphone just happened to tear itself out and walk away. Then he spoke up. Look, Cap, Nate's telling the truth. We were nowhere near here, and none of us would sabotage rescue like this. The man's eyes snapped up to look at him. 
I saw Spencer shoot an accusatory look at us. Then where exactly were you? Considering that the captain called you over 20 minutes ago and told you to meet up with us right away. A wave of confusion washed over me. What the hell are you talking about, Spence? I asked. He rolled his eyes at me. Oh, come on, dude. Don't give me that confused look bullshit. The captain radioed you and said we found the keys. When you asked him if you four should meet up right away, he said yes. Then you said you guys were on your way and you'd meet us here. A mixture of shock and further confusion began to rise in me as I saw Wyatt and Vinny exchange puzzled looks. N no, that ain't right, Wyatt finally said. Nate asked that question all right, but when the captain replied, he told us to keep going and search the restaurants for food and supplies. The captain turned an incredulous eye on Wyatt. What restaurants? Nobody ever said anything about restaurants to me. I just... I just said try and find some food and supplies. Everyone began to argue, but the sound was drifting away from my ears as my mind raced. It, the, he's right. We, he never said anything to me about restaurants before we split up. Just supplies. A shiver ran down my spine as another dot connected. And I never said anything about the restaurants when I applied to him. He was the one who... The realization slammed into me like a truck... And I felt all the blood drain from my face as the simple but terrifying conclusion came to the surface. That wasn't the captain. I breathed out. Everyone stopped arguing to stare at me. What? Andrew asked, seeming confused. I slowly turned to look at the three who'd been with me, quietly repeating myself. That... That wasn't the captain who talked to us. I saw the realization slam into Wyatt and Vinny's faces. I saw their faces turn as pale as mine was. Oh, fuck no, Wyatt whispered, his eyes beginning to frantically dart around in their sockets. Somebody want to explain to me what the hell you're saying? Captain demanded. But I didn't answer. I, I stared at the shocked and frightened faces of my crewmates. At my two crewmates. I forced my voice out in a squeak. Where's Will? Everyone went silent as they began to look around. Then they began to call his name. And finally, everyone began to run around, searching for our missing friend. Spencer dashed up the stairs to the bridge, returning later to confirm that it was deserted. Panic began to well up inside of me as we moved from the bridge down to the promenade deck. The guy was here not even five minutes ago. How the, how the hell did he slip away? Will! I heard the captain call as he led the way down to the main lounge which stood as empty as it had when we left. He turned around, a look of panic on his face. Where the hell did he go? He exclaimed. As he continued to run for the other end of the room, a thought slowly began to push forward in my mind. For the life of me, I still can't explain why it came to me, but the more I persisted, the more I became convinced that I was right. The veranda grill, I shouted. Everyone turned to look at me, realizing most of them didn't know what I meant. I stabbed towards the aft section of the ship. The restaurant we went to. Wyatt and Vinny's faces changed as their minds clicked. Moments later, the three of us were racing down the hallway. The others struggled to keep up. We took the stairs down to the restaurant deck, two at a time. The marble steps threatening to fling our feet out from under us. Reaching the landing, we sprinted past the pursuer's office and down the hall. I didn't even spare a glance at the still open porthole. I didn't look at anything until we reached the entrance to the veranda grill. Where I stopped, dead in my tracks. Would you stop running for? The captain's voice began, but his voice died away as he heard it as well. Everyone stood as still and as silent as a statue, listening. There were voices coming from inside the restaurant, just out of sight around a corner. I felt my pulse quicken and my heart begin to pound again. The first voice I instantly recognized as Will's. The man's snorting laughter was unmistakable, but it was the second voice. It was a woman's voice that... Yet another time that day froze my blood in my veins. Like Will's voice, this voice spoke too softly for me to be able to make out any specific words, but it was loud enough that I was able to make out one specific detail. The woman spoke with a clear British accent. What the actual fuck? Andrew managed out. I slowly turned to the captain. His face had turned white as a sheet, and I saw his lower lip quiver slightly. Then it set. 
and he strode forward. Captain, no! I whispered, reaching out to snag his arm, but he tore himself out from my grip and walked into the restaurant. Instantly, the voices stopped speaking, and he simply stood there staring at something out of sight. Then he gestured for us to come and join him. We all walked quickly to stand next to him. The restaurant was empty. Looking exactly as it had when we left one exception. At a table near to the piano, Will sat with his back to us. He didn't turn around as we entered, simply continued to sit and stare at the wall. Everyone exchanged a look, and then the captain led us over to him. As we approached him, I, I suddenly became aware of a smell which hung in the air, one which was impossible to miss. Perfume? It grew stronger as we stepped next to him, and, and for a moment I, I was terrified that we'd see him dead, his mouth wrenched open in a silent, unending scream. Instead, to our surprise, a, a happy, content smile adorned his face. His eyes were glazed over almost as if he were drunk, or hypnotized. Will, the captain finally asked, his voice low and gentle. At his words, he swung his head to look at all of us. Oh, hey guys, he said, his voice sounding almost like a character in a cartoon who'd just been struck by Cupid's arrow. Wyatt spoke up. Dude, where did you go? You scared the hell out of us. Will shrugged his shoulders. I'm sorry about that, everyone. Just... I just met the most wonderful woman. He let out a content sigh. The woman of my dreams, for sure. A chill ran up my spine at these words. What woman? I managed out. He smiled. Her name's Diana. She's an actress. A singer. So intelligent and interesting. He sighed again. God, what a woman. Then he turned more towards us, exposing the other side of his face. If I hadn't felt so mentally fried, I, I might have gasped. There was red lipstick marks on Will's right cheek. The kind you get when a woman wearing it kisses you. It stood out clear as day, and even from this distance, I could see it still looked... wet. Will's smile grew. She likes me, you know, he declared, looking like the happiest man in the world. In any other situation, it'd be a sight that would warm my heart and make me happy for the man. In this situation, it scared the ever-loving shit out of me. Okay, this is too fucking creepy. Spencer finally said, his voice trembling slightly as he looked around the restaurant. You're not kidding, man, I silently said. The captain turned to us, worry now clearly etched onto his face. Does anyone know what the hell's going on? He asked. It's time to come clean and tell them. Tell all of them the truth. I forced myself to speak. As much as I wish I didn't, I, th I think I do. Everyone turned to me. I took a deep breath, and then I began to speak. I, I told them everything, about all the things that you guys said, the, the things they denied, about the horrifying things I saw in the darkened hallway yesterday, and about, about what the four of us experienced, not even half an hour ago, right in this very restaurant. As I spoke, I saw some of the crewmates' faces go pale. Others seemed to fight what I was saying. I saw Spencer and Andrew didn't believe a word I said, or at least... They didn't want to, but I... I saw that the captain did. When I finished, there was a long silence, and then the captain spoke. I'm not entirely sure I believe all this. That this is the actual Queen Elizabeth, and we're aboard an actual ghost ship, but this... He gestured to Will's still smiling face and lipstick on his face. This is all I need to see to make up my mind. He looked over at me. 
We have over a week and a half of food and water left. We're going to gather it up and lower one of the lifeboats. We're going to row the fuck away from the ship as fast as we can. And we're going to pray that we make it back to land. At his words, Will's face suddenly turned to worry. No, no, I, I don't want to leave, he said. Not after meeting Diana. I, I want to stay. The captain grabbed Will by the arm and hoisted him to his feet. Frankly, son, I don't give a damn what you want. We're leaving now. The younger man began to protest and struggle, trying to wrench himself out of his grasp. But the captain was stronger, and he pulled him towards the exit. He was almost shouting as he entered the hallway. Get, get the fuck off me! I, I, I don't want to fucking go back to that shitty, fucked up world that's 2023. I, I want to stay here. She said I could stay, that my, my dream to stay forever in the 1950s could be real. I felt a chill at his words. We continued following the captain. We just reached the bottom of the stairs when the huge vibration surged up to the floor in our feet. It was so strong that I, I nearly fell on my ass. The hell was that? Vinny spoke up the same words aloud. What the hell was that? A new sound began filtering up from beneath our feet. A deep, low-pitched hum that slowly began to intensify. I slowly saw the captain's face pale even farther than it already had. He breathed, then began tearing up the stairs, dragging Will behind him. As we followed, I suddenly realized why he'd reacted the way he did. When I was a little child in the 90s, I traveled aboard a cruise ship with my aunt and uncle, and I clearly remember the noise the giant engines made as they powered up before we left port. The engines are starting. Everyone raced for the nearest door to the outside deck. I prayed that I was wrong, that the ship would still be dead in the water when we emerged outside. I wasn't. When we emerged on the deck into the fading light, it was to see that the ship had begun moving, accelerating far quicker than I thought such a huge ship ever could. The water at the stern stretched out behind us in a foam, churned up by the ship's huge propellers. As we stood on the deck, I felt a sinking, hopeless feeling fall over me. We can't escape in the lifeboats now. We'd be sucked under and torn apart. Slowly, silently, everyone turned away from the sight, unsure looks in their faces, except for... Except for Wills, who wore a grinning, ecstatic look. We're back in our cabins now. We've partnered up, each having... Three or four people per room. Nobody wants to be alone now. The captain took Will into his room. He refuses to let him out of his sight. The doors are firmly locked, though I doubt after what I've seen if they truly want in. They'll find a way, and, and the, the fire axes we've brought into the rooms with us won't do a damn bit of good, you know. Somehow the others... They've fallen asleep, Spencer and Andrew on the giant bed, Wyatt on the floor with a blanket and pillow. I, I think... I think I'm the only one still awake. The ship doesn't want us to leave. Enough to fire up its own engines and take off. For where, I, I don't know. I'm terrified. I don't know what's going to happen to us. I don't. I want to ask you what we should do now, but I don't know if any of you would have any idea of what to do in a situation like this. And yet... And yet I have to. It's the only shred of hope I have left, so... So please, what should we do? How can we even attempt to stop the ship? How in the fuck can we defend ourselves against things that are, that are already dead? And what in the hell is happening to Will? What did that woman he spoke of, Diana, what, what did she do to him? 
I was about to finish, but I have to tell you two final things. Two things that scare me almost more than anything that's happened today. The first is that I hear music. You know, not music over the intercom, but actual live music filtering in through the door and the walls. It's an old song. When I recognize a song my grandmother used to listen to constantly. A big band song, In the Mood by Glenn Miller. But worse is that I, I hear their voices. I hear laughter, and occasionally I, I hear screaming. But that's not the part that scares me the most. It fills me with an existential dread as I, as I was sitting here typing, something was forced under the door. When I flicked on my flashlight with shaking fingers, I aimed it. I saw one of those programs, like the one I'd found yesterday. When I went over to it, though, I... I saw it was different. A smiling cartoon octopus stared up at me from the cover, one that was playing a trumpet and violin, its tentacles holding the same objects that had been on the other program. When I, when I opened it with shaking hands, I saw two things that made me want to scream. The first was the date in the upper right-hand corner. Wednesday, December 6th. 2023. The second was on the left-hand page under the notices bulletin. We would like to welcome aboard our newest passengers. Gabriel Lerner. Wyatt Strosky. Vincent Goitano. William Jenkins. Andrew Weber, Spencer Michaels, and Nathan Rogers. We hope you enjoy your stay with us. God help us. God help us. I want to remind you guys that I also do narrations over at Chilling. The Chilling app is available for Android, iPhone, and if you'd like to get your hands on the Chilling app and hear myself as well as many, many other narrators, and they have a whole new setup where you can watch movies on there now, and it's also free to try out with ads now, so you don't have to get a subscription like you used to before. You can actually just get the app, you can start watching, you can start watching on your PC. It's evolved so much since the last time I have updated you guys on this, and sincerely, it's a great place if you want to see more horror, especially if you like horror audio. So strongly, strongly suggest you check out the Chilling app. And finally, I want to give a huge thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. So I want to give a very special thank you to Jordan Hummel, Diana Krause, Disciple, Strategy Wolf Emoji, Sullyman, Brandon Mendoza, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kaltuna, William Wellington, Scruffy the Janitor, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Jenna, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Verbal Horror, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Mike, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Corbin Dallas, Estabine, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Dirt Diver 030, Voice of Sand, Psychomel, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Croconut 509, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. I really appreciate your support, and I cannot thank you enough. I wish you all the best. Sweet dreams.